Welcome to another episode of Think Theism, the podcast from Rosh Christi to Texas A&M. I am your host, Zach. I'm joined by my co-host and Schrodinger wave surfer, Andrew Robbins. Hi there. Uh, today we have a special guest, Dr. Michael G. Strauss. He is uh, the David Ross Boyd Professor of Physics at the University of Oklahoma. How are you doing today, Dr. Strauss? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for inviting me to come. Yeah, we're, we're really glad that uh, you're in town. And I noticed that you are Michael G. Strauss, not to be confused with the physicist at Princeton. That's a different guy. Uh, <laughs> That's correct. There is a Michael A. Strauss who is an astrophysicist. I'm an experimental particle physicist. We occasionally get each other's email, uh. and we've met once in person. In fact, he's co-written a book with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, so mm -hmm. so he's got some notoriety for that. That's good. I, that's happened to Which me. is why I use my middle initial, so <laughs> that we can somehow be differentiated. I got you. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned your experimental physicist at uh, uh, University of Oklahoma. So what type of research are you working on most of the time? So I'm an experimental particle physicist, which means I study the fundamental structure and forces that make up the universe. Mm -hmm. I do my research at CERN Laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland where they have the Large Hadron Collider that accelerates protons to basically the speed of light, smashes them together and see what comes out. Um, since I only go to CERN maybe four or five weeks a year, uh, most of my research is done online or, or with the data from CERN mm -hmm. at my home university. So um, I have graduate students who live at CERN. I'm on meetings to Europe pretty much every day, um, but most of the time I'm looking and analyzing data while at the University of Oklahoma from that experiment. Most of my career I've studied how quarks and gluons are put together inside the proton, something called mm -hmm. quantum chromodynamics. But since about 2010, so, so since I said most of my career, it tells you how old I am. Oh since God. 2010, <laughs> the last yeah. nine years, I focused on two things, um, actually three things. Um, the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012 and we're mm -hmm. still measuring its properties, trying to understand it, so I do that. We're also looking for other particles like the Higgs boson um, of, that would be of different mass with slightly different properties. And I've studied properties of the heaviest known particle, elementary particle called the top quark. But you know, the goal of pure science is to kind of understand the universe. And then engineers and others come along and take that understanding and build you know, products and things that make our life better. But as a scientist, your goal is really to understand the universe. And as a particle physicist, our goal is to understand that the very fundamental basic building blocks of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, in addition to the particle physics, you also kind of moonlight doing um, the uh, studying the intersection of uh, Christianity, science, uh, integrating faith and uh, intellect and things like that. Yeah, since I am a scientist and a Christian, there are a lot of um, questions that come up and discussions about, um, there are some people who think those two can't go together. There are a lot of people who think they can and even integrate them in different ways. So mm -hmm. um, I joke that my night job is discussing the intersection of science and Christianity. <laughs> Gotcha. And uh, this is actually culminated in a book, right? Yeah. Um, about a year ago, I published my first book or had my first book published. It's called The Creator Revealed. A physicist examines the Big Bang in the Bible. And it's it kind of fills a void. There were a lot of books out there that talked about how science and Christianity fit together, but none of them that I found were written in a way that a non-technical person could understand and enjoy. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a bad sense of humor, and so I've tried to write this book in a way that um, a non-technical person, maybe a high school student or a junior high student, could enjoy and understand and get through in, in, you know, relatively briefly. It's a 150-page book or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I read it just this past week. I was uh, particularly struck by one of your uh, tangents on talking about the law of gravitation and then turning that into marriage advice. Yes. I, I implemented it. My wife was grateful. Uh, <laughs> She didn't appreciate me explaining uh, how I wanted to calculate the gravitational constant of our marriage, but right. that's okay. Yeah, uh, you'll have to buy the book to get the joke, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that one was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So, uh, yeah, so your book is actually split in two parts. So the first part uh, is mostly focused on science, uh, 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 the scientific evidence for the existence of God, and then the second part is more Christian-specific, you know, integrating the uh, theology uh, and scientific discovery, the Bible, uh, things like that. Some people tend to kind of balk at this term, scientific evidence for God. You get one class of people to say, oh, you're doing God of the gaps. And then you get another class of people that say, God and science don't overlap. Whenever you're talking about scientific evidence for God, are you treating God like a scientific hypothesis? Is he out there like the Higgs boson? 
Yeah, you know, you can't prove God from science, but I, I think the way I would phrase it is I have a friend who is a pretty good artist. Um, he actually painted a picture that hangs in the Oklahoma State Capitol. I mean, it is Oklahoma, so you right. Texans might not think that means much, <laughs> but um, he says when you look at a piece of art, you see the soul of the artist. So as a scientist, I look at, if there is a creator, I look at the creator's piece of art, this universe, and I should see characteristics of the artist because I look at his piece of art. Does that prove, you know, necessarily prove anything about the artist? Not necessarily, but it infers lots of things about the artist. And so what I would say is by studying God's creation, if there is a God, his piece of art, there should be things I see about his character. And that's kind of what I call scientific evidence for God. It's looking at the universe mm -hmm. and inferring things about um, what might be out there based on what I see in the universe. And I think what you see is that a, a transcendent being, much like the biblical God, who is an intelligent designer, even has a purpose and cares for humanity, is a proper inference from what we see by studying nature itself. Okay, so uh, God isn't necessarily being treated you know, like a fundamental particle, like you can measure God and see how tall he is. Well, you really can't measure a fundamental particle how tall right. it is either, but. Yeah, so as far it. as we know, fundamental yeah. particles have no size, but they do have mass. Doesn't that sound cool? Yeah, that, yeah. that is very, very interesting. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so God is sort of um, like this artist that we can infer from creation. One of the key arguments that has been popularized in the past 30 years is what's called the Kalam cosmological argument. It basically says that Things that begin to exist have a cause. Uh, the universe is one of those things that began to exist. So the universe has a cause. And if you're looking for good candidates for causing the universe, God's pretty high up on that list. There are a thousand and one objections and ways that this can go. But one thing I'd, I'd like to focus on in particular is um, the BGV theorem. Or Borde Guthvillian. Borde Guthvillian. I yeah. get them switched every time. Yeah, so do I. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and their first names all start with a V. Yeah, oh, that's... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's rough. No, so, uh, I'll show with an A. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, Alexander, so, Allen, and Arvin. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, yeah. So this theorem it gets brought up a lot as sort of evidence that the universe began to exist. What exactly is this theorem claiming? What is it not claiming? And like, how how airtight is it? My understanding of the theorem is that what it's saying is that any universe that is expanding on average must have had a beginning. It's based on what we call classical space-time, but that isn't necessarily classical physics. Um, classical space-time basically means that all the way back in space and time, there is still such thing as cause and effect. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not quantum physics versus classical physics, even though the word classical is there. And there are very few loopholes in it, to be honest. So, so what's the loophole? That classical space-time breaks down when you get near the beginning, or that this universe isn't expanding on average. Okay. That for some reason it expands and contracts equally, or so we're just in a period of expansion or something like that. But my understanding of looking at the paper um, and reading both what, you know, what Vilenkin writes exterior to the paper about what it says is that um, there are loopholes to any scientific theory or idea. There are loopholes to things that we have completely, you know, confirmed with every experiment. All we have to do is find one experiment that violates it. It's no longer true, 100%. But this, so, so nothing is airtight, but if this universe is expanding and if classical space-time continues to the beginning, then it's pretty much airtight. It, it's a very strong indication that the universe had a beginning. Uh, one more thing I'll say is that everything we know from science, whether it's classical general relativity or whether it's BGV theorem, all point to beginning. So if I want to try to say there is no beginning, I have to invent science that is, has, has of yet no evidence for it. I call it atheism of the gaps. <laughs> right. Now, is that invented science going to be true? Are we going to find out this true? We might. But right now, all of the science that we know points to beginning, and yeah. only speculative ideas point to no beginning. Okay. That reminds me of, I, I think that uh, 
Alexander Vilenkin elsewhere actually says almost exactly that, that all, all of the evidence that we currently have access to points to um, space-time not being past infinite. Yep. And, and it's not just theoretical evidence, it's the observational evidence too. Now again, observationally, we can't go much earlier than about 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the quote origin. But, but to me, you know, this is compelling. You mentioned God of the gaps. And in fact, Christians have been, you know, accused of when we don't understand something, we impose God there. And, and then I think God of the gaps arguments aren't, aren't very good because when we find the explanation, you have to remove God. But, but this is really atheism of the gaps. Mm -hmm. Everything we know indicates there's a, a beginning and we don't know what happened prior to some number, 10 to the minus 32 seconds or something. So if I don't believe in God, I have to say something um, in that time period, not only is something we don't understand is based on my ignorance, but precludes everything we do understand ultimately. Yeah. Um, there is one alternative that I, I'd like to bring up. So uh, uh, in your book, you were talking about how um, Ellis, Hawking, and Penrose were working uh, with the Einstein field equations and ultimately developed what are called the, uh, the singularity theorems. Um, which, as I understand it, basically says you take our universe, it's expanding, you run the clock back, you, you get a point uh, in time and space where there's nothing before that, and, and that's the singularity. That would be the beginning. Um, and recently, uh, Penrose has kind of been getting a lot of popularity uh, because of an interview he did, I guess, about a year ago. He's uh, offered an alternative called uh, cyclic conformal cosmology. And effectively, as I understand it, the, the idea is that as the universe expands, eventually it reaches an energy state that mathematically is equivalent to a singularity. And effectively, what his argument is, um, is that you get the equivalent of a cyclic universe model, even though it's not like the, the same as like the old school ones from mm -hmm. like the 19th century or 20th century. Um, but rather what you have is a singularity and it expands out to another singularity and then that expands out to another singularity and you get these kind of sequential things and allegedly if the guy who came up with the singularity theorems wrote it I assume it meets the conditions for that and I think it also meets the the conditions for uh, for BGV uh, as well so yeah, I, I was curious so, what, so where, where this goes I actually need to read Penrose's book because I'm getting more and more questions about this and I haven't read the book myself I have read some critiques of the book. Mm -hmm. um, what I understand is that there's some, as with any proposed theory, there's some real problems. First of all, most physicists don't think that it's a viable model. Um, uh, Sean Carroll has pointed out that it, it doesn't really lead to a singularity as much as a smooth universe. Mm -hmm. And we know that the microwave background radiation is smooth, so somehow you know, the smoothness of the universe is a problem for the Big Bang Theory that's solved with inflation. So what um, Penrose has said is that if we have a universe that it continues to expand, first of all, all the massive particles lose their, lose their mass, mm -hmm. which we have no mechanism for. We therefore end up with a smooth universe. And since a smooth universe is what we started with, could this ending point be the beginning of something else? But this ending smooth universe has a super small energy density. The initial universe had a super high energy density. The, there's been a temporal evolution of our universe that doesn't seem to coincide with this smooth universe that Penrose developed. So uh, I need to read the book, but by reading the critiques of the book by scientists who are no theists themselves, mm -hmm. Um, it seems to me like this has as many problems, there are different problems, but as many problems as other ideas that have tried to avoid a, a true beginning. Now what um, Penrose argues is that there is some inference in the, um, the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB, that his model is correct, but that also seems to have been refuted. So, so right now I see this as just another speculative idea that has different problems, but similar problems to, to any cyclic model. Um, and I think, you know, to put all your eggs in this basket is, is not a real wise thing to do right now. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it seems like, uh, at least for this question on whether the universe began to exist, uh, most of the evidence, or apparently all the evidence, according to Lincoln, is pointing towards 
at least there being some some temporal. Uh, yeah, everything we know, I would say. Again, what we don't what we don't know is the first ten to the minus twelve seconds, twenty seconds, thirty two seconds, and anything could have happened. So, um, I think it's real important to, to understand this. You know. Is God going to give us, even if he's the creator, unambiguous evidence that this universe had a beginning? The God of the Bible doesn't seem to usually give irrefutable evidence for almost anything. He gives enough evidence that reasonable people can come to a conclusion. And, and, and Christian faith is based on evidence. It's not what Richard Dawkins says, some believing something without evidence. That's not faith, that's stupidity. And so I think we have enough evidence to say that this universe seemed to have a beginning. All the evidence points to that. Will we ever have slam dunk proof? My guess is probably not. Okay. Um, I'd like to pivot now to a, another argument that's usually discussed. This is called the uh, uh, fine-tuning argument. And basically, the gist of it is that there are certain aspects of our, our universe that are uh, rather delicate. Uh, so, for example, if the universe expanded too quickly, um, we wouldn't have the conglomeration of uh, stars or even massive bodies for life to eventually develop. Uh, there are a lot of different constants and quantities that pop up in different fields, chemistry, biology, physics, astrophysics. And effectively, there are a bunch of them that pop up saying that if they were just slightly different here or slightly different there, uh, the universe wouldn't develop and life also wouldn't uh, develop. Uh, and you mentioned this in your book as well. Yeah. There are equations that I use in, in my own field of engineering that have constants built into them that are really delicate. Like if you tweak them a little bit, the data just falls apart. But in those equations that I use, I don't think that those variables that I'm using are telling me anything about how delicate my universe is. It tells me more that the model that I'm using, the mathematical tools that are in place are very delicate. And if I tweak them too far, it doesn't fit my data. Why think that these constants that are delicate are, are telling us something about our universe being delicate rather than just like the equations themselves? I mean, you bring up a philosophy of science question, right? Whether we're discovering laws or creating laws mm -hmm. and what are the equations themselves and, you know, in Hawking's words uh, from Brief History of Time, do the laws have fire? You know, who lights the fire under the laws or whatever? Um, but I, I think the difference with the universe is you can do computer models that give the phase space, mm -hmm. the broad parameters of the universe, and you find that the habitable universes occupy a very small phase space. Um, I'll plug somebody else's book. One of my favorite books that's not came out a couple years ago, three years ago, is A Fortunate Universe by Luke Barnes and Grant Lewis. These are two theoretical astrophysicists who do this very game. Mm -hmm. their, their job is to play with the parameters and see what happens. And what they find is you have this teeny tiny phase space out of this larger possibility that allows a universe to exist, period. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't seem to me like you're just trying to fit the data, unless the data is a habitable universe. <laughs> And, and when you say what is possible for a habitable universe given a reasonable range of parameter space, it's, 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 it's an extremely tiny fraction of that parameter space. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd actually like to discuss one in particular. Uh, there's one called the cosmological constant, uh, lambda. It's every time I read anything with fine tuning, this one always comes up. But I, I have had the hardest time trying to figure out what it actually means. As, as I understand it, it is a variable in the Einstein field equations that governs the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what Einstein put in. He put in a cosmological constant that changed the acceleration. Today's cosmological constant is, is not exactly the same thing, but it mm -hmm. does come about from the fact that we know the universe is expanding. And if you look at the rate of expanding, th this fine tuning of this, I would say, is um, somewhat suspect. Here's the thing, you have what you call natural parameters. If you put in you know, what we know from nature, you can come up with expectations of what you expect. <laughs> As if that's not redundant. Anyway, when you put in the natural parameters that we know, and you ask what would the cosmological constant be, it's 120 order of magnitude different than what it is. Mm -hmm. But you could really play devil's advocate and ask, well, why would you expect those natural this natural order of things to 
give you what the cosmological constant is. So I don't think this is necessary, although some people say it is the most fine tuning because it's 120 orders of magnitude. Until we have a better feeling for what's the cause of this cosmological constant, mm -hmm. I think um, it's an interesting number because it is 120 orders of magnitude different than what your naive expectation would be. Mm -hmm. But given that it's naive expectation, it's hard for me to say that this is necessarily finely tuned. Now, it is true that if it was something different, much different, we wouldn't be here. Jean Carroll said, well, the best cosmological constant would have been zero, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know that I necessarily agree with, actually. That's another story. But, um, but I would say, you know, it can't be very big or we wouldn't be here, and it's not. Uh, but I don't know that this necessarily 120 orders of magnitude is a fine-tuning thing or just pointing to something about nature we don't yet understand. Okay. In, in your estimation, what do you think is like the most persuasive example of, of fine-tuning? Um, I, I, some of the ones I talk about in the book are the ones I'm most familiar with. I think okay. um, I, I would ask Luke Barnes what are the <laughs> best ones, probably. Okay. but. You know, the uh, strong nuclear force, which I studied, is tuned to a few percent. The mass of quarks um, in the proton is tuned to a few percent. Um, ratios of the coupling constant of gravity to electromagnetism uh, for stars to work and, and atoms to work is tuned to a few percent. There are a lot of these few percent things that I think really do seem to be things that are one could argue somewhat arbitrary and if you change them we wouldn't be mm -hmm. here and you multiply things that are you know um, a few percent together it's not long before you get really astronomically small probabilities mm -hmm. um, so i guess another part of my intuition maybe this is just because i'm not a particle physicist um, but what what would it mean to when you said there it seems like it's arbitrary like what the strong nuclear force is um, first Am I correct in saying the strong nuclear force is what keeps the protons and neutrons bound in the nucleus? Yeah, residual strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force okay. is really what keeps the quarks together in the proton. But if you're a chemistry person, just like the van der Waals force right. is a residual electromagnetic force, mm -hmm. the, the keeping the neutrons and protons is in some sense a residual strong nuclear force. Okay. So uh, I guess the question is why, why would you think that that number could have been different? Well, I would turn the question around. Why, why is it what it is? I mean, in, in essence, it could be anything. I mean, could is a re weird word here, right? Yeah. Um, some, some physicists would like to come up with a theory that mandates it to be that. But to me, that would still just push the question back one. Why is it that that theory is what governs our universe? I mean, this is a, a more of an interesting, maybe philosophical question. There are many physicists who think if you can write an equation describing the universe, you've solved all the why questions. Sean Carroll basically says that this in an in a article he wrote called Why There's Something Rather Than Nothing. He says there's this philosophical why question, like, mm -hmm. you know, why is the universe here? Well, science can't answer that. We can just answer the why mechanical question, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, you're just punted the ball down the road, right? Or whatever. Um, you're not really answering why if I can write an equation that describes it. I mean, I can write an equation that describes why the physical beams support this building. That doesn't build the building. And so to me, um, you know, these parameters in and of themselves, we know of no reason why they aren't completely arbitrary. But even if I could find one, if I could find an underlying law of physics that requires mm -hmm. them to be what they are, has that solved the problem or has it pushed the problem back one step? Yeah, it seems like it switches the question to uh, why is it an essential function of reality that human beings exist? And, and yeah. there are some scientists who are, in fact, John Carroll, who I respect a lot and I've read mm -hmm. a lot of his stuff, he resorts to its brute force. It, yeah. There is no other alternative, this is the way it is. And to me, that, again, is saying I, I don't have a good answer or, or we will never have a good answer. I don't know. It, it, it's to me a way of saying it, it's, it's saying science has its limits. Right. And maybe since I'm a philosophical naturalist, that's the only limits I'm willing to work in. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you're a philosophical naturalist or science has its limits, then there might be much of the universe we can't even ask questions about. And to me, that's not satisfying even as a scientist. Right, because then you're, you're sort of arbitrarily truncating your epistemology and just saying, I'm only interested in these questions. And Right. Well, and if you're a philosophical naturalist, you're saying those are the only questions that are answerable, mm -hmm. which to me is either wrong or arrogant or both or something. Mm -hmm. Right. I I definitely agree. Uh, so on so to kind of recap where we've been so far, we've got the fact the universe began to exist. We've got that uh, life in our universe or our universe is fairly fine tuned for life to exist. Uh, and you put those together and you're starting to get pretty close to, to something that looks and sounds uh, kind of kind of like God. Let's say the let's say these arguments are successful and, and now we uh, we've shown that there's a creator and uh, designer of the universe. Um, how do we bridge the gap between that this guy and like Jesus? In, in the Bible itself, it talks about not these words, but this idea that there's something called general revelation, which is God revealing himself to all people, primarily through nature, but also mm -hmm. through morality and conscience. And then there's special revelation where God specially reveals himself. And as a Christian, we believe that special revelation is things like the person of Jesus and like the Bible. So you can only get so much from general revelation. What I think is remarkable is that we, what we get from studying nature gives us a picture of a creator that is consistent with the biblical God and inconsistent with other gods. Okay. If the universe had a beginning, then the universe itself can't be God. Pantheism seems to be ruled out. Mm -hmm. If the universe is not cyclic, then ideas, world, worldviews that say everything is cyclic, like Hinduism, seems to be ruled out. If the universe seems to have a purpose, then some deistic God with no purpose, um, if the universe seems to have purpose for humans, seems to be ruled out. So what you find is as you begin to study nature and look for what's consistent with the message of nature, you, you start to zero in on a God that looks a lot like the Christian God. But of course, if you really want to take a step further, you have to go beyond general revelation to special revelation. And anyone who knows anything about Christianity knows that the validity, the truthfulness of Christianity rises and falls on whether or not Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus of Nazareth did not rise from the dead, then Christianity is a farce. Uh, Paul even writes that. Anybody who believes it is a fool and should be pitied. And if Jesus rose from the dead, mm -hmm. then it validates all the other claims. And to me, if you wanted a logical progression of how do I, I I'm an, a hardcore atheist, what should I do? Well, the first thing you should do is look at the evidence for science to see if there's a God or not. I think that evidence is extremely strong point to God. And the second thing you should do is look at evidence for, from history as to whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, that validates all the claims. And it is an objective question. Mm -hmm. We ask question, historical questions all the time. Uh, there's a common metaphor of two books, you know, a book of nature, a book yeah. of scripture. They're both written by God. How do you go about sort of integrating those books together? There's certainly a um, false claim or indictment made of people like myself who believe that God used the Big Bang as the method of creation, that we're somehow putting science ahead of the Bible. And I just think that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, I once heard somebody who believes the universe is only 10,000 years old claiming he was not a young earth creationist, but a biblical creationist, as if those of us <laughs> who believe God used the Big Bang don't believe the Bible. Of course, I believe that the Bible is, is true in everything it teaches, um, and I think I could support that. But um, it's not putting one or another over another. It's asking what is the message of each one. And so I believe that if you look, so, so I'm not trying to force science in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say what seamlessly meshes these together. And, and I think what I believe has come to that. But even beyond that, I think that, um, you know, the Bible is not a book of science. Mm -hmm. It is a book that speaks truth. The story of creation is a story written, you know, 3,500 years ago with maybe an oral tradition long before that that has to speak to all people in all cultures and all languages and all times. Mm -hmm. And as such, um, it isn't written in modern scientific language. 
But the remarkable thing about it is it's completely consistent with modern science. Mm -hmm. um, you are probably familiar with Hugh Ross, who mm. is the founder and president of, of an organization called Reasons to Believe. And his um, testimony of how he became a Christian is quite remarkable. He was an, an astronomer who, um, an amateur astronomer who um, looked at all the holy books in the world to see if any of their science had any validity. He read Genesis 1, only believing, of course, in the science of the Big Bang, and realized how seamlessly the story of creation in Genesis 1 fit with the um, understood science of the origin of the universe. And he said, this is a unique book. No other book in the world has the story of creation that would have been appropriate and culturally relevant to the people it was written to, but yet is accurate and culturally re relevant in a scientific world. That said to him, there's something special about this book. He read the rest of the Bible and became a Christian. But to me, that does say something. How is it that you have a story that is culturally relevant and spoke to the people of its day in a way that confronted the false myths about creation of its time and does the exact same thing, you know, 35 um, centuries later. Mm -hmm. It's quite remarkable. It says something special about this book and you don't have to force it. You just have to understand wh what the language and culture is saying of, of the story of creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think someone might uh, think, wow, you're saying the Bible and science agree, but you know, science, evolution, Big Bang kind of stuff, like six days, et cetera. How do you go about taking a narrative or taking a story that takes place in a week, ostensibly six days, uh, and then say it matches up with a universe yeah. that's 14-ish billion years old? So, you know, when, um, when you want to try to understand something, you have to know something about the language and culture. One of my favorite examples is a book on how to study the Bible for yourself by Tim LaHaye. And he said, if I'm listening to a baseball radio broadcast mm -hmm. and the announcer says the base runner is hugging the base <laughs> and I know nothing about the culture and context of baseball, I'm going to get the wrong impression of what that's saying. Mm -hmm. So if I want to understand the story of creation, Genesis 1, I need to know a little bit about the culture and the context it was written in. And it doesn't take long before, if you delve into that, you realize that things like the days don't mean 24 hours. Gleason Archer was one of the best um, Hebrew scholars of the 20th century, and one of his books he writes that it's his opinion that the original author could not have intended the six days of creation to be six 24-hour periods. He's, he's totally upfront about it. He could not have meant that. Mm -hmm. And you talk to a lot of people who understand ancient um, Hebrew culture and language, and they will tell you the same thing. Ancient Hebrew has no word that means a long period of time, an epic or an era. It has a word that means from eternity, olam. So if the writer wants to write that the creation occurred in six periods of time, the only word he has is the word yom, which is translated day. And what I realized, so I went through a period where I, I don't speak ancient Hebrew, but there's a lot of resources in English that can help us understand it. What I realized was that if I really take the Bible seriously, meaning I try to understand what it means that the base runner hugged the base, mm -hmm. not just take it naively, the more I understood the ancient Hebrew language and culture, the more I realized that these six days are not meant to be 24 hours. And it's, if you listen to those who believe that the Bible teaches the universe is 24 hours long, um, they will seldom delve much into what the Hebrew texts say. They will mostly stick with English. I have heard them discuss certain Hebrew commentaries, mm -hmm. but they'll pick and choose which ones to use because right. those are the ones that support their view. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to me. Any, anybody who speaks two languages or has tried to translate something knows that translation can be tricky, particularly over 3,500 years because cultures change. But it really seems to me like... Um, from my study, that the best understanding of what the original author meant is not that the universe was created in six 24-hour days. Okay. And for those who don't care what the Bible says or don't believe it doesn't matter, but mm -hmm. it's such a criticism that you can't believe the Bible and believe in modern cosmology, and it's, it's, it's a naive criticism. It's based mm -hmm. on a total 
naive reading of what Genesis as like saying that the base runner must be embracing the base. Mm -hmm. So uh, one question that, that I have to kind of feed into sorting out where there may be uncertainty in the Bible or, uh, you know, I, I, you mentioned that there are a variety of different views on Genesis. Uh, one of the questions I have is what are the valid ways of figuring out what that author actually meant? And, and in particular, the question that I'm, I'm aiming for here is, is it ever valid to bring modern science into conversation with the ancient author? Yeah. Um, so I think, let me point out how important your question is because the goal of understanding is all, any piece of literature is to understand what the original author meant, right? Mm -hmm. um, so is it possible? Well, there's many, many um, verses in the Bible that say that the earth is immovable. Mm -hmm. that it rests on foundations. And um, before Galileo, most people thought that they took that, what my brother, who's a biblical scholar, calls wooden literal, a literal with no ability to bend like wood. Mm -hmm. Now we read those and understand they are um, from a perspective. In fact, I still want to, if I'm going to build a big building, I still want to build down to bedrock, put its foundation to bedrock. Why is it? Because I believe the earth is immovable once I hit bedrock, right? Yeah. And so we still use that same terminology. So here's my rule of thumb. In passages in the Bible that for the um, history of commentaries, commentators, scholars trying to understand those passages, there's been debate and discussion, particularly on those passages that have scientific implications. We, of course, should bring science in. Mm -hmm. When we sat, find that the earth is the, not the center of this universe and not immovable, we should understand that those verses are from a perspective. And if you go back and read ancient writers, they all understood that was a possibility. Mm -hmm. If you go back and read ancient writers and scholars for Hebrew, uh, the, the story of creation, from Augustine's time and before, they debate what the days mean. So since there's been no consensus ever, of course, we should let modern science um, help, you know, influence our understanding and in better word is inform our understanding of what that means. Now, in certain things, they're unambiguous. Those things, I'm not going to let modern science change my view because modern science say resurrections don't happen every day. I'm not going to therefore say the resurrection is some kind of, you know, non-historical story. It's clear from the very beginning and all time, everybody has taken this mm. as a historical account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so maybe it, it might be good to say that uh, where science appears to conflict with the Bible, maybe that's less a, a battle to fight and more an opportunity to reevaluate maybe a hasty interpretation. Yeah, and, it, and it's not, you know, I would say since Scripture is not a science book, mm -hmm. the things we learn about science are probably going to inform our understanding of Scripture more than the other way around. But... In, in you know the philosophy of science that might say miracles don't happen like Hume would say you know now I think scripture informs my philosophy of science right if there's a, a God who created the universe he can certainly intervene in that universe and do real miracles so mm -hmm. um, again I don't think it's one or the other it's this interplay like an artist who has made two paintings that depict uh, two sides of the same thing. In fact, I was just in um, Paris mm -hmm. and going through a museum. I can't remember um, whether it was the Louvre or somewhere else, but there was actually this painting mm -hmm. of David killing Goliath, and on one side of the painting it's from the front, mm -hmm. and on the other side of the painting it's from the back. Yeah. And now to look at that and say this contradicts because I see David's backside in one and his front side in the other, would not understand the painting and I you know but to say these are two views of the same thing and therefore they show two slightly different things mm -hmm. is to co correctly understand those two paintings okay so I have a question kind of building off of this it seems like today the within the kind of evangelical world the young earth old earth debate is kind of dying down certainly in the last 10 years in Russia Christi what I've seen is Ten years ago, students coming into Rosio Christi, we probably had 70% coming from a very strong young earth background, um, whereas today, I mean, maybe 10%. Um, there's a, a much stronger um, kind of awareness of the old earth creationist views and a, a more acceptance of that. 
However, on the issue of um, biological origins, this I, th I think we still have this uh, pretty strong debate. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on biological origins and literal or non-literal atom and some, some of those thoughts. Wow, yeah. So this is right up my alley as a particle physicist, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But it's a good question. And, and at, first of all, I'm encouraged to hear that the debate has died down a little bit. I mean, if, if you took, you know, three possible positions within the evangelical community, young earth creation, old earth creation, which says the Big Bang occurred, but not macroscopic biological evolution, and then evolutionary creation, and argued that let's say a third of evangelical Christians were in each of those categories, then two thirds of everybody's wrong. And I think that's important to realize. Um, but it's encouraging to hear that those numbers are becoming a little bit more even handed. I think that's probably particularly true of people you're dealing with who are coming to college. I would say if you go to the average conservative church, particularly in um, College Station or another southern Bible Belt town, mm -hmm. you would still find that the default position is kind of this naive reading of the Bible or whatever, the young earth creation view. Um, so the first thing is that there are these three views, right? And there are good scholars who and good Christians who would hold all three views. So one would say the earth is only 10,000 years old and evolution didn't happen. I think that's indefensible from a scientific and um, biblical view. And then the next would say God used the Big Bang, um, but evolution didn't occur. Uh, not at least we're not all related to a common ancestor. And then the third would say God used the Big Bang and evolution. Um, I actually think that the latter two could be defensible from a biblical viewpoint. If um, So my, my pithy short answer is I have no problems with biological evolution from a biblical viewpoint, but I have tremendous problems with it from a scientific viewpoint. And to me, that's the difference. The science of the Big Bang is overwhelming and indisputable. To me, as a particle physicist and a lay person reading the biological papers and synopsis of those papers, the biological, the, case, the scientific case for evolution is far from indisputable. Um, I think if it was, then I think that evolution is easily, um, could be fit into the biblical record. Um, and a literal Adam and Eve somehow could be fit into the scientific record. Um, I write a blog um, on this, and I put like five, five blog posts not long ago on dealing with this issue of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the bigger question may be like where, where really are the limits? There are definitely some positions that are just a, a, a touch beyond the pale. Yeah, there, I mean, there are some people who say evolution is incompatible with Scripture, so, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think I would draw the limit there. Um, I don't know where the limits are. I think... I think we need a real Adam and Eve. Okay. I think the story is more than allegorical. Um, mm -hmm. Whether or not they are literally the genetic ancestors of, of all of humans, I don't know. There's a new book out by um, Josh Swatamas, Swat right? Sw yeah, Swami Das. Yeah, Swami yeah. Das, sorry. Yeah, I heard um, of him. Yeah, who, um, who talks about this new idea that we're all genealogically related to mm -hmm. Adam and Eve. If, even if we're not genetically. And that's what the Bible gives us, a genealogical description. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know the answer. I th from my perspective, reading scripture, there has to be a literal Adam and Eve. Exactly when they lived and where they lived and how they're related to everyone, I think there's some possible explanations. I'm very much a traditionalist. Mm -hmm. I believe still that within the scientific um, genetic record, and I've actually talked to uh, Peaceful Science, which is Josh's organization about this. They don't agree with me, but I've looked at the, the data myself. I believe there's a place for a literal Adam and Eve who are the genetic parents of all of us um, sometime 50 to 100,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, most geneticists and um, uh, would not agree with me on that. Mm -hmm. But I've looked at the data myself and I have a hard time saying that that can't be a possibility. Yeah, the, the thing that, that gives me pause on that is some of the activity that Adam and Eve are described as doing, you know, they, they, they sound like Neolithic farmers. Um, yes, 10,000 years ago. Right, so, a lot more recent. So what I would say 
I mean, and Reasons to Believe has some good stuff on this. Fuzz mm -hmm. Rana has written a lot of good books on this. He would say that um, the beginnings of the things mentioned at, from Adam and Eve are in the fossil record, in the archaeological record, much beyond before the 10,000 year. And so that these things in their rudimentary form keep getting pushed back. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, every position has areas of tension. And I think the biggest area of tension in old earth creationism is exactly who Adam and Eve were and when they lived. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are possibilities, including something like uh, Swamidas might say, um, which would put them as, as much as 10,000 years ago, as early as 10,000 years ago. Again, I don't think these are tr the traditional view. I don't think they're the place I would go to first. But I do think they are um, biblically supported. And let me give you one example, right? Uh, Romans that says, as one man sin in the world and death through sin, so death passed to all men, says that as one man righteousness came into the world. And if I was to take that, uh, um, that parallelism too far, I know my righteousness from Christ didn't come because I'm genetically related to Christ. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that my legal position of being a sinner didn't come because I'm genetically related to Adam? I, I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. My theologian colleagues struggle with that interpretation of Romans. But I can't, you know, if the parallelism is there, maybe it's possible. Uh, again, I, I don't think this should be a point of contention. It's a point of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, for those of you, for those who think I can't be a Christian and believe in evolution, I would say, sure you can. There are plenty of Christians who do. Mm -hmm. For those who say I can't be a Christian um, and, you know, if I'm a Christian, then I have to believe in some obscure ideas about Adam and Eve. The answer is no, you don't. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Christians who are good scientists, who understand the science, who have a place for Adam and Eve in, their, in the historical record. Mm -hmm. And so these things to me are things that are still not enough data to make definitive statements. Yeah. Um, traditional views still have a place that could be, that in my opinion are most likely true. Mm -hmm. But just like the predominant view that the earth doesn't move because the earth, the, the text says that the earth is immovable, um, there's a possibility that science will inform some of our understanding of these things. Mm -hmm. I will say that I, I like um, Josh's idea because it, it really, it, and, and this is, makes it maybe indefensible as a scientific theory, but it is unfalsifiable. His idea <laughs> yeah. allows there to be a literal Adam and Eve 10,000 years ago that we would be genealogically related to that we could not ever falsify. Mm -hmm. um, and there, but the positive is that means that you can hold to the biblical case and, and it can't be shown to be false. I don't know if that's good or bad. It's not <laughs> yeah, good true. from a scientific point of view, but it's maybe good from a theological point of view. Perhaps. Uh, you know, one, one thing that uh, this past year I, I was started reading quite a bit from, uh, of literature from the Second Temple period, uh, like the books of Enoch and things like that. Yep. And if there's one thing that I have learned is that speculations about Adam are not a new phenomenon. Yeah. The, the, the types of roles that Adam played in some of, the, some of that literature is just does. It's, I mean, frankly, it seems bizarre to me, but the, if our uh, Hebrew spiritual ancestors felt the freedom to speculate in their literature, I think that, you know, we should probably have that freedom well, too. I think this is a really important point because, you know, I'm a conservative Christian scientist. I believe the Bible is true. And I believe that even the historical stories are true, but what does that mean? Um, my pastor puts it this way, are there ancient parables in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. just like there are parables in the New Testament? And the real question is, what did the original author or readers, author and readers get from this? Mm -hmm. and, and if the original um, author, let's say, was telling a parabolic story about a real fall of humans, then that's what it's meant to be. Now, again, I don't think from my understanding that that's what it is, but I'm gonna be wrong about a lot of things when I get to heaven. Right. And, and I think the fact that there has never been a definitive idea about 
the story of creation, the days of creation, Adam and Eve, there's always been prevalent ideas mm -hmm. and consensus ideas, but never, you know, 100% um, consensus ideas that, that we should hold those things loosely. We don't hold, you know, deity of Christ, salvation by grace through faith. Even, even me, I don't hold the inerrancy of scripture loosely. Those things I hold mm -hmm. tightly, but exactly how that all plays out, I think we need to have some understanding that we don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, as you said it, if our ancient, uh, if, our, if our Hebrew ancestors who understood the language and culture better than us speculated about what this actually meant to the original writer, then I think for us to, for us to make the dogmatic statement that we have the answer is, is pretty arrogant. Do you have any advice for um, college students that are that are interested in um, these types of questions and in how they can integrate their Christian faith into what what, what their ultimate um, career will be if they want to go into science or something like that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. My, my first point that I make to anybody who comes to my office and says, you know, I'm looking for what God wants me to do in my life or whatever, is you should be called to whatever you're doing. There's this idea that you have to be called to professional Christian work, but God called me to be a scientist. I could tell you the story. And he, he wants you into, he wants to call you to a specific field because you will have opportunities to advance God's kingdom that nobody else will have. And so what I would say is always think strategically about what am I passionate about? How am I gifted? And how can I not make using that to advance God's kingdom an afterthought but a forethought in everything. Um, there are so many good resources. Um, Reasons to Believe is a great resource. Peaceful Science is a great resource of people who are good scientists and good theologians and wrestle with these questions. And the other thing I think that I've learned over the years, um, two things. One, no questions out of bounds. If, if Christianity is true, then um, I shouldn't be afraid that some new information is going to overthrow it. And if it does and it's not true, then I'm not going to believe it anyway. So no questions are out of bounds. And there, there are good answers to those questions. And, you know, so when you hear the um, answer that seems to overthrow Christianity put out by the new atheists, you just need to go read the other side. Um, take a logic class because that will be extremely helpful in discerning good arguments from bad arguments. And to be honest, I, I read as much stuff from people I disagree with as those I agree with. And the arguments for the Christian worldview are so much stronger than the arguments against it. The arguments for the beginning of the universe are so much stronger than the arguments against it. And so um, be willing to ask the tough questions, but don't take superficial answers. Delve into them, and if Christianity is true, it will hold up to, to those kinds of questions. Um, and I think that's great advice because there's some people who think, well, if, if I find out this to be true, then it's gonna destroy my faith. No, the only thing that'll destroy our faith is, faith is if we find out the resurrection isn't true. Um, most everything else, um, people have wrestled with for centuries and we're not going to have definitive answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, uh, Dr. Strauss. Your website is michaelgstrauss.com uh, and the book is A Creator Revealed, uh, which I assume is available on Amazon. And wherever it's available by Amazon or anywhere yeah, books are sold, right. right, as they say. All right. Thanks so much. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate being here.